Mac gaming. It's always been a bit of a punchline, despite Apple's best efforts. The fundamental problem is that it takes substantial development resources to bring games over to the Mac OS platform, which occupies a small fraction of the computing market. Every year, a few high-profile games are trickled out, but most titles skip it entirely. But what if there was a better option? Apple recently released a tool called the Game Porting Toolkit, which simulates a Windows environment and translates DirectX API calls to Apple's own Metal API on Mac, all the while translating x86 instructions to Apple Silicon's ARM instruction set. It's effectively a translation layer, just like Proton, with the same capability to run high-end games at playable frame rates. So just how good is the game porting toolkit? Are we on the verge of a Mac gaming revolution? Actually getting the game porting toolkit set up on a modern Mac computer is a fairly simple process. The first thing you have to do is upgrade your Mac to Mac OS 14 Sonoma, which is only available as a developer beta at the moment. Unlike prior macOS betas though, it does seem like anyone who has updated to macOS 13.4 can upgrade to the Sonoma beta, not just those who have paid to be in the developer program. From there, the easiest way to get set up is to download Whiskey, which is essentially a graphical interface for game porting toolkit. From there, download the disk image file for game porting toolkit and boot Whiskey and drop it in. Then you just need to download Windows executables for any game launchers you want to use, like Steam, open them up within Whiskey, and basically use that launcher just like you would on a PC to download and start games. It's a fairly simple process to set up, though I did notice that Steam was pretty slow here and tended to get hung up on simple operations like reserving space and installing games. But once games are installed and loaded, the experience is surprisingly often excellent. The first game I took a crack at was the 2023 remake of Dead Space. Out of the box, my Xbox controller, which was connected to my Mac via Bluetooth, was immediately recognized and usable with full force feedback. Critically, the game itself renders without any obvious graphical flaws here, running at 1440p with FSR2 performance and medium graphical settings. The Game Porting Toolkit translation is converting the PC visuals flawlessly, without any artifacts or corruption. That's a really big deal, because the technology actually works and operates without any special effort from the user. In-game performance isn't quite so positive. We're mostly at 30 to 60 FPS here, even with fairly conservative settings. Keep in mind that the M1 Max I'm using is roughly in line with a desktop RTX 3060, at least in synthetic benchmarks and well-optimized games, and the 3060 is typically good for substantially better performance. It's definitely playable, but far from ideal. More concerning are the frame time spikes. Dead Space is punctuated by lengthy hitches, typically lasting a few hundred milliseconds or so, although they can last up to a second and a half. I think we're seeing a mix of the game's traversal stutter alongside shader compilation stutter here, just blown it to a sort of ridiculous degree at times. Some issues seem clearly shader compilation related, like when loading up this sci-fi interface, while other problems seem to occur when passing loading thresholds. The game does feature shader pre-compilation, although it doesn't seem to address all of these issues, which is also true of the native PC version. After muddling around in 30 to 60 FPS territory for a while, I cut the settings as far as I could reasonably go, to a 1080p output, facilitated by FSR2 in its ultra performance preset, along with medium visual settings, and that steep settings compromise was finally enough to get us to 60 FPS performance. It's not a perfect 60, as some of the volumetric dense areas seem to raise substantial issues, but it is a very playable and sort of decent experience once you've gotten past the compilations that are rich opening. There are no rendering issues and I couldn't see any unexpected problems with the game logic either. And this is basically a one-click port enabled by the game porting toolkit. Next, I hit up Gotham Knights, a reliable CPU stress test, and a game that has curiously lopsided performance. I'm using the same basic setup here, a 1440p output resolution enabled by FSR2 upsampling in its performance mode and medium visual settings. I did try to fiddle with ray tracing settings here, but they've been disabled, which is perhaps a limitation of the translation layer. Though given that Apple Silicon doesn't accelerate RT in hardware, it's sort of a moot point either way. 
On the positive side, the game graphics continue to render without issue here, and I had no issues whatsoever hopping in and playing just as I would on a gaming PC. Unfortunately, we're typically in 30 to 60 FPS territory here as well while playing, though this is less unexpected than with Dead Space. Gotham Knights has a poor CPU performance profile during open world traversal, bound by the limits of a couple of CPU threads, which throws up issues here. High-end PCs can brute force through this with high clocks, but the M1 Max is limited to just 3.2 GHz as a maximum clock speed on its performance cores, which is probably putting a ceiling on the effective frame rates from this title. But on the flip side, indoor scenes hit and hold a stable 60 FPS with these settings, and feel very smooth. The game is quite playable overall, despite the two-faced performance profile, and keep in mind that mid-range and low-end PC CPUs will exhibit similar issues. And the visual presentation seems perfectly respectable, if still a little bit short of the level we would expect from a comparable PC GPU. Next up is Hogwarts Legacy, though the results here sort of speak for themselves. We can get in-game in the game renders without obvious problems, but performance is very poor, hovering in the teens. I'm using 1440p with FSR2 performance and medium settings, but no combination of options was enough to give a playable experience in this game, at least on the current patch on my system. I took a look at Cyberpunk 2077 as well, a really popular title that also happens to be a great stress test. I did have to make further settings compromises to guarantee good performance here with a 1080p output in FSR2 performance mode with medium settings, though the game still looks quite good, I would say. In the city, we're usually in the 30 to 40 FPS range, sometimes rising to the low 40s in indoor segments. The game renders without significant issues in my experience, though I did encounter a glitch while driving where I was flung around the game world into the interior of a building. Now I have noticed similar glitches with other official versions of Cyberpunk, so I wouldn't say this was a problem with the translation necessarily, but perhaps it could be. Generally speaking, this is a good looking and very playable version of the game, though it comes in well below the performance level of this class of GPU. If we dial in the game at 4K with FSR2 in performance mode and high visual settings, we end up with performance that hovers in the 20s throughout the in-game benchmark sequence, with an average frame rate of 24 FPS. But a 3060 equipped desktop machine scores much better results, with an average frame rate of 51 FPS. We have to step down to a GTX 1060 before we're in the rough territory of the M1 Max running under game porting toolkit suggesting that we're getting somewhere around half of the performance that we should probably be seeing. As an aside, because of the unified RAM setup on Apple Silicon Max, the reported GPU RAM allocation is pretty stupendous. We're looking at nearly 50 gigabytes of RAM for the GPU alone here, which is easily enough to power past any of the texture issues we often see with low-end and mid-range PC GPUs. The last game that we're taking a crack at today is Psychonauts 2. Settings-wise, we're at native 1440p resolution here, with resolution scaling disabled and medium visual settings. Performance is surprisingly favorable, with a typical run of play hovering around 60fps and occasionally dipping slightly below. I ended up dialing the resolution down to 1080p partway through my run to see if we could bring the game up to a lock 60, but performance didn't really seem to change. I did notice some graphical issues with this game, namely colorful artifacts around the edges of geometry during cutscenes, but during gameplay things seemed basically fine. I thought it would be interesting to see how Psychonauts 2 compares to its native Mac version. Curiously, Psychonauts 2 runs in game porting toolkit slightly faster than the genuine port, though it's worth keeping in mind that the Mac version is built for Intel Macs, so it's running through Rosetta 2 translation here. I do expect that a good Apple Silicon port would run at a faster clip, without the burden of any translation layers. The PC version tells a pretty familiar story. The RTX 3060 smokes the M1 Max, which ends up with performance that falls somewhere between a GTX 1060 and an RTX 2060. It's not a very impressive showing and again reflects a substantial performance deficit relative to where we would typically expect a GPU of this caliber to land. Overall, I think the game porting toolkit is impressive tech. It effectively translates advanced Windows games over to the Mac with zero effort on the part of the user. Graphical issues are kept to a minimum, and games often run without obvious issues. 
Granted, other tools like Crossover and Wine, which Game Porting Toolkit is built on top of, also manage to run Windows titles. Game Porting Toolkit can handle DirectX 12, however, which means it can actually work with the last few years of Windows games. This is a difficult task, as the team behind Crossover has documented, so getting plug and play functionality out of a wide range of demanding DirectX 12 games is a big accomplishment. Unfortunately, it does come with some major caveats. The majority of DirectX 12 titles that I tested using Whiskey didn't boot, or couldn't make it past the introductory video files, and performance in games is often pretty shaky, clocking in at about half the performance level of comparable Windows systems. With a fast Mac, you can still get a pretty decent experience, but it does seem inefficient relative to a PC or a console with similar hardware. It does suggest, however, that it would be relatively easy to develop official ports of a lot of existing Windows games with this tool, which is where I would expect it to have the biggest impact. Max will probably never get a full-on Apple Silicon-driven rebuild of a game like Dead Space, but with the Game Porting Toolkit version already running without issues and with playable performance, it could be a game changer. I wanted to close things off by taking a quick look at the new Mac port of No Man's Sky. The porting effort itself isn't very special. The game runs okay, but it suffers from periodic frame rate drops that make it pretty unsatisfying to play in my opinion, even on lower graphical settings. But it does offer an opportunity to take another look at Apple's impressive Metal FX upscaling tech, and to compare it to popular PC upsampling solutions. This time, we have options for spatial and temporal upsamplers, which each come in a variety of options that operate from different internal resolutions. At 1080p, these appear to range from about 540p to 828p, depending on the quality level that you select. If we pair the temporal upsampling option in its performance mode up against popular PC upsampling solutions, it fares surprisingly well. In stills, it offers very good temporal stability and a very 1080p-like resolve, just like DLSS 2. FSR 2 has a pretty big problem with shimmering on foliage here, which we simply don't see at all with Metal FX Temporal. Camera movement reveals some artifacting in the Metal FX Temporal presentation, although the DLSS 2 view is only a little bit better. I did notice a bit of shimmering on the geometry here in this static shot in the Metal FX Temporal view which also made an appearance with FSR 2 on PC, but was kept to a minimum with DLSS. This last shot brings Metal FX Temporal back up to parity with DLSS, and I'd say it actually looks slightly cleaner if you do look closely at foliage elements, and FSR 2 is predictably not doing too well. As we covered with Resident Evil Village on Mac last year, Apple's temporal Metal FX upsampling is very effective, and delivers very good image quality while keeping GPU demands firmly in check. In No Man's Sky, we have the first opportunity to compare it directly with PC upsampling solutions, and I'd definitely say it's more DLSS 2-like than FSR 2-like, at least in these tests. Even when working with a quarter of the output resolution, the results are excellent. Unfortunately, the Metal FX spatial option doesn't really do much at all for the final image. This seems to be a simple spatial upscaler just like FSR 1, though any impact seems to be pretty minimal. Expect a super jagged and raw image, bereft of any anti-aliasing coverage whatsoever. Apple's attempts to turn the Mac into a gaming platform have been less than satisfactory. A limited market share plus proprietary APIs and tools have kept titles away from the Mac audience, despite Apple putting decent GPUs into most of their computers. With the advent of Apple Silicon, we have seen a handful of high-profile ports, but that only goes so far. Game Porting Toolkit changes that equation, taking Wine and Crossover and supercharging them with extremely effective direct 3D to metal translation. This is a drag and drop solution for developers to get games up and running immediately, and can be effectively deployed by users as well. Performance is a little bit of a problem, but hardly an insurmountable one, especially if you have one of the higher end Apple Silicon devices. I came away very impressed with Game Porting Toolkit, with Apple continuing to ship advanced graphics technologies, supporting high end Apple Silicon ports, and now bridging the gap between Mac and PC game development the future looks bright for gaming on Macs. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and press the bell for YouTube notifications. Check out the Patreon at digitalfinder.net for exclusive and early access content, and to get in touch, just use Twitter. Thanks for watching.